So let me tell you today about Gwen. Gwen is a sister in Christ that Judy, who works in the office, and I met this week. Gwen is a stately African-American woman of undetermined age from Mississippi. And she came this week to ask for assistance. Now usually when people come and ask for assistance, we give them a card for Subway so that they can at least get something to eat. But we had run out, which is what Judy told her. She then asked for prayer, which is where I got involved. I went out into the Kinship Cafe area to greet Gwen, introduce myself, and the first thing she did was ask me if I had anointing oil, which I do. So I went and got the anointing oil and went out, and Gwen and I sat on the bench out there by this door, and she told me her story. Now, I won't go into all the details, except to tell you that Gwen is homeless, She's waiting for a place in Haven of Rest, but they're full right now, which I had heard from someone else, actually. Haven of Rest, by the way, if you don't know, is the homeless shelter in Akron. She was wearing her wardrobe, which included two pair of pants, two shirts, a winter scarf, and flimsy shoes. She seemed to me to be very honest, very forthright. And the thing she kept saying about herself was, Pastor, I'm pitiful. There's just no doubt about it, I'm pitiful. But she also said over and over again, I don't have anything, but I have Jesus. When it came time to pray, she asked me to put the anointing oil on her ear to keep the harsh voices out. And then she asked me to put oil on her foot, which she said had been injured in a gun, gun accident. And indeed, when she showed me her foot, it looked like she had little pieces of lead all just below the skin. She asked me to pray for her ankle and anoint her ankle because she had sprained it, she said, running from a dog that was chasing her. And then she asked if I would put anointing oil on her hand so that she could anoint her own mouth and nose and eyes. Because she said those were the portals of the devil. Now that sounds a little out there. But then she explained it. She said, you know, through my ears I hear people making fun of me. And then I want to lash out myself through my mouth. And so she went and healing there. And so I prayed. We prayed. And I want to tell you that when I took Gwen's hand, I felt no anxiety. Now, I can't say that about everyone who comes for assistance. Many people come for assistance frequently. Sometimes I'm somewhat uncomfortable. Although we always try to interact with as much graciousness as possible. But I felt no anxiousness about Gwen. I held her hand. I prayed that she would be surrounded by God's peace and love and that her needs would be met and that she would be safe as she spent the night on the streets. And then as we finished praying, she looked at me and she said, Pastor, I'm hungry. Can you give me something to eat? Can you give me a drink of water? So I was headed for the kitchen to see what I could find for her. Knowing we had bottles of water and maybe some apples or some cheese. And on the way, I was thinking about, well, maybe I should just take her across the street and buy her a meal. Well, as I was on the way, Judy 
had been looking through the files, we used to give away giant eagle cards and for a variety of reasons stop doing that. And she came across a leftover giant eagle card for $15. So when Gwen left, she had a bag I gave her with two bottles of water and an apple and that giant eagle card. And the last thing I said to her before she left was, Gwen, you are not pitiful. You are a loved child of God. And then I stood at the door and watched her, the Market Street door, and watched her leave. And she got about halfway down the sidewalk, not quite to the bus stop, and this is what I saw. Gwen raised her hand, and she said, Thank you, Jesus. I know you're with me. Thank you, Lord. Don't you and I left? And I have to tell you, I was humble. Because I have so many material blessings. I have such good health. I have a whole congregation of, of family around me. And how often do I, with such joy, with such gratitude, say thank you to God. Thank you, Jesus. Her voice was filled with joy and gratitude. And I thought of two things as I watched Gordon walk away. Honestly, I did. The first thing I thought of was our Lutheran cheer that I taught you last week based on Ephesians 2, which, as you all know, we're reading for five weeks in a row as part of our stewardship emphasis. Remember the cheer? For what were we created? Good works. It's our way of life. And of course, the basis of our good works, the thing that makes our good works good, is that they are born out of gratitude, out of a sense of thankfulness for all the gifts that God has given us, particularly the gift of grace, so that we are, are forgiven without having to have done anything to so I thought of that, and then I thought of the leper in today's gospel lesson who returned to give thanks. Here's the situation, as we sort of jokingly acted out this morning, there were ten people who had the disease of leprosy. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about what leprosy did to people. It was a skin disease. But let's just say it wasn't pretty. And let's say that the end result was always death in the first century. Now, now it's very treatable. But in the first century, the end result was always death with a great deal of suffering. And part of the suffering was that if you had leprosy, you were, you were isolated from your family and friends because it's very contagious. So if you had leprosy, you were put out on your own with, with other people who had the disease, and you no longer could touch your spouse or look your child in the eye or have a family dinner. All the normal things that people do. On top of that, People had the idea that leprosy was the result of some hidden sin. In other words, if you had leprosy, it was the external manifestation of some <coughs> internal hidden sin, and God was punishing you. So the person who had leprosy was isolated from the community and from his or her own family, plus he had to deal with the guilt of feeling like, what 
did I do that caused God to do this to me? So, these ten people who have leprosy see Jesus. They keep their distance as the law requires, but they call out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us. Maybe they've heard that Jesus has healed people, or even particularly people who have leprosy. And so Jesus says to them, seems sort of odd to us, go and show yourselves to the priest. Well, in that day, if a person claimed to be cured of leprosy, which probably didn't happen, but if a person claimed to be cured of leprosy, they had to go to the priest, and the priest would give them a certificate that proclaimed them healthy again and able to return to what we might call the land of the living, to their family and friends. So, it took a step of faith, really, for those ten to head out for Jerusalem to find the priest. And as I was kidding with the children about, on their way. I mean, really, imagine it. Here they are, they have various levels of this terrible, debilitating, skin-eating disease. On their way, one of them looks down and sees that their skin is, is restored. That they no longer have this disease. That their, their fingers that were being eaten away are, are now perfect. Can't, I mean, can you imagine? They were probably just doing a little dance and, and thank you, I can't believe it. And, and, you know, they're excited, they're whooping, they're shouting, they're jumping for joy. And then they realize, if I get that certificate, I can go home to my family. And so they, you know, they take off. You can imagine, you can understand it. To go to the priest, get the certificate, and be able to go home to their loved ones. Except for one. Except for one. And that one happens to be the one who is twice cursed. He not only has leprosy, which alienates him, he's a Samaritan. And in that day, a Samaritan, because of religious and cultural considerations, was considered to be an outcast, was considered to be despised by the Jews. And so he was both a Samaritan and a leper, which made him two times an outcast. He doesn't go to the priest or head out for Samaria. Instead, he goes back to Jesus. And he's so overwhelmed with gratitude and joy that he doesn't just stand in front of Jesus or kneel before Jesus, he prostrates himself, it says in scripture, before Jesus, filled with gratitude for what God has done for him through Jesus. And that's when he's twice blessed. The one who is twice cursed is twice blessed. Because Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. Now the thing we have to understand is the Greek word that is there translated, at least in the New Revised Standard Version, as made you well, is a word that often is also translated saved. It means a wholeness of a body, mind, spirit. And so, this man was blessed, as was true of the other nine, with physical healing. But in addition to that, because of his gratitude, because he recognizes the power and presence of God working through Jesus and then in his life, he is saved. He is made whole spiritually psychologically, physically. Now, I would guess, now it doesn't, we don't hear any more 
the story, the Bible, yes, that he could then recognize himself as no longer pitiful, but as a child of God, and maybe able to do things he's never been able to do before. Maybe he even became a follower of Jesus, and through him, other people were blessed because he told this story of how he had had this dreaded disease, and he had been healed by this man, this teacher, through whom God was powerfully working, named Jesus. The point is this. He was blessed. He recognized that blessing. He acknowledged it. He showed gratitude for it. And that opened up the door for more blessing. And then he became a blessing to others. And how true is that for us? God blesses us. And when we acknowledge, recognize, show our gratitude for what God has done for us, the door is opened up for more blessing, and we can become a blessing for others. There's basically two ways that we show our gratitude for God, at least that I can think of. One is word, through, through worship, through praise, through praising God in, in, in worship, in song, in prayer, in telling someone, hey, you know that great thing that God did for me. And the other is through deed. Using our time, using our talents, using our money to do good. And convey the love of God in the world. Now, if you want to see that happening in a very, very concrete way, here's just, just one option. There's lots of options, but here's one option. Come over here at 6.30 on a Wednesday night. We just started our Starshine service. Here's the situation. We have been get, given gifts of abilities among us and resources. So we, led by the Holy Spirit, I must say, it's quite a story. It's really like Pastor Carolyn's story. But led by the Holy Spirit, we started a service for people who have intellectual and physical disabilities. We've only done it two weeks. Last week we had nine people. Different people than we had the first week. Last week's people, <coughs> yes, were all in wheelchairs, I believe, maybe all but one. And most of them were non-communicative. They were here with their caregivers and their family. And about 18 congregations. And we worshiped God together and had a craft and refreshments. And here's what happened. People were blessed. Not only our guests, but their caregivers and their family members and everyone who came to help. As we recognize the blessing of God in our lives, the door was opened for more blessing, and we became a blessing. That's what happens when we go, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You're with me. Thank you, Lord. Well, if you don't see yourself doing that, then how about this? For what were we created? 